Well, welcome to our Thursday evening wine conversation. And we're sitting here in, in Margaret River in Western Australia. Uh, I'm Bruce Dukes, the winemaker for Passel Estate. And here with Cassandra, the Celador legend and <laughs> incredible musician singer. And we are joined by Wendy and Barry Stimson in sunny Singapore. Singapore, I've so, got one, one more part. Good afternoon. <laughs> and I hope uh, all of you guys have got some uh, lovely 2016 Lot 71 uh, Passel Estate Syrah Reserve so that you can join us. And this is a, a very, very special day for us and particularly some people in Singapore. And so I guess first thing I want to do is uh, maybe decant this beautiful wine. You can see Wendy's online. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> and of course, with this beautiful wine, there really is no reason why we have to decant it. It's just fun and that's really what wine's all about is is having some fun. Does it change the wine? How does decanting change wine? Uh, I think it lets a little bit of air in and I think of it as the, the wine has sort of been locked up in the bottle for a little bit of time and it, it just sort of gives a little bit of air and helps bring out its personality. Uh, and it's just one of those sort of fun things that sometimes with an old wine you might decant it because there's some sediment in the base of the wine. Sometimes with some young wines to just put a little bit more air in it. Uh, but bottom line is I just I just find it fun and some of the, the cultural things associated with wine uh, and the enjoyment are as equally as important as the beautiful wine. So probably most importantly is Now, one of the lovely things about these tastings are that I'm betting most of the people are uh, at their own homes and so can actually uh, have a glass of wine and enjoy it without having to worry about driving. So, I'm thinking I'm probably talking to a lot of people who are in beautiful Singapore, so I just wanted to geographically, I guess, orientate you to where we are and so when you look at a, a map of Australia, Margaret River is in the very bottom left-hand corner of the map. And so it's the very southwest of Western Australia. And to me, that the Margaret River region is just uh, an amazing region that I feel so fortunate to be able to, to live in this area, uh, to make wine in this area. And it's, a, it's quite a, a set of natural conditions which have come together that seem to make it a lovely place for particular types of agriculture and of course one that I love is the the wines and so from where our, our lovely vineyard is at, at Passel Estate on uh, we're at 655 Ellenbrook Road that roughly uh, seven eight kilometers to the west we have the Indian Ocean and of course, with the structure of Margaret River, uh, about 70 kilometres to the north, we have Cape Naturalist. Uh, 30 kilometres to the south of us, we have Cape Lewin. And so we, we've got the two capes at each end of the, the Margaret River region. And so what that gives us is this beautiful Indian Ocean actually to the north of us, to our west and the Great Southern Ocean to the south. And the Margaret River region only goes inland from the coast about 30 kilometers. And so we have this just beautiful, soft climate. So it's called a maritime climate. And that maritime climate is very gentle. It's a very long, gentle growing season that the vines start growing from around mid-September. We'll go through the growing season and uh, a beautiful, red like this that typically ripens toward the end of the season. Our Syrah uh, will ripen in typically in early April. And so it has a very long 
gentle season. And it's really thanks to that beautiful insulating oceanic effect and the cooling breezes that come from the southwest in the afternoon that really make it a lovely gentle climate to grow the grapes in. I think I better have a sip of wine. Oh, if we must. <laughs> Cheers. To Cheers. Oh wow. And one of, one of the other things, we've got this beautiful soft climate, but we really also need the soils to match with what we do. And Western Australia in particular, the southwest of Western Australia is uh, tectonically stable. So it means it hasn't sort of been moving around in geological times and so we have uh, soil that's literally formed in place and so the very early days millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago this whole area that we're sitting on was granite rock and it's that granite rock that's literally decomposed in place that's formed these beautiful soils and they're of course the beautiful soils that are literally under us at our Passel Estate vineyard and I think why these soils are so good for grapes is that over the millennia, most of the nutrients have been leached out of the soil. And so we have these beautiful, well-drained soils, but only sort of moderate levels of fertility. And so the, the moderate fertility in the soil means the vines can grow, achieve a lovely sort of balance and form, but be in balance so they, they grow starting mid-September, uh, by Christmas time, they've kind of got lovely sort of full length shoots that might be about a metre long. And then, of course, the, the, they basically stop growing because they've formed their solar panels. The natural water that's stored in the soil is nearly sort of running out. And the, these vines are incredibly intelligent things and they know, hey, time to stop growing, time to start actually ripening the fruit and putting all our resources and sugars into the ripening of the fruit. And so it's really that combination, I think, of those beautiful soils, the beautiful climate, that things really come together for some varieties in Margaret River. And so now, now I digress to the wine. <laughs> I'm looking, we've got a few new people joining us, Barry, Barry's in as well, Barry and Wendy. Um, to get in a little bit closer. Hi Rob, Rob Glass says hi to you. Hello Robert. <laughs> and we have some questions already coming in, so um, I think Bruce is going to do a little bit more so talking. So this is our, again, our, our Passel Estate 2016 Lot 71 Syrah. And so it is called Lot 71 because our first 70 attempts didn't work. No. It's called Lot 71 because along Ellen's Book Road, the original land divisions that our block of land uh, with our beautiful vineyard is called Lot 70. And so we, we've named this after the very original nomenclature. And so with this wine, what we're looking for is to try and really understand what the characters of the fruit are in this wine. And it's from understanding the, the characters of the fruit that then we seek to translate it to a, a wine that, that's culturally meaningful to us. And so with this, this wine, what's important to me and what I think are uh, some of the absolute joys of Margaret River Syrah are just those beautiful high-level perfumes uh, and the fleshy tannins and just succulent sort of natural acidity. And so really when we, we look to harvest this, uh, and this is actually all hand harvested, that we're really looking for that overall balance of the fruit and really, the, the only way to, to find or determine that balance in the fruit is simply tasting the fruit. But although we can measure sugars and acids and things like that, you know, we're making this beautiful worldly food. It's, it's not a chemistry set. And there's just nothing that can replace sort of tasting the fruit, 
feeling how the tannins feel in your mouth, the flavours, the level of acidity. And so we, we seek to actually capture the, the fruit at a, a moderate level of ripeness. So it's still got just so much personality and verve and spice. And then all of this fruit is actually hand-picked. And so this hand-picked fruit, and the hand-picking is very important because the way we, we sort of approach this fermentation, it's very sort of old school, traditional, and actually in, in the base of our open fermenters, we'll actually fill the first third with whole bunches that actually have the stems in them. And then on top of that one third whole bunches, the other two thirds we de-stem. So take the individual berries off the stem, but don't crush the berries and put the berries in whole. Because a, a variety like Syrah in Margaret River has very sort of delicate, soft skins, and so we've got to treat it very delicately. And of course, with the two thirds whole berries on the top, one third whole berries or as bunches on the bottom, uh, it allows kind of some cool things to happen in the ferment because we have the, the yeast that start fermenting the grapes. But then within the individual grapes that the yeast can't quite get to all the juice at the beginning, we have different sort of internal changes that happen in the berries. And those, those internal changes are called carbonic maceration. But what they really do is just introduce some really uh, spice-like characters. And I sort of get little sort of hints of these beautiful things like, like star anise, Mm -hmm. cinnamon intermingled with the blackberries and then the, the management or the approach with this with the ferment uh, is it, it's in an open fermenter so very very old school and, and literally handmade with these beautiful <laughs> hands my, my cello hands Wendy uh, and three times a day we, we play beautiful music all day but three times a day we'll come along and just gently submerge the grapes at the top and so those ones at the top of the whole whole ber whole berries without the bunches and they'll gradually sort of break down over four or five days with the process of fermentation uh, and as the sugar levels sort of drop we still have the whole berries on the bunches at the bottom and of course in the bunch stems you sort of bite them and chew on them and they have tannins in them like the tannins in the skin that give uh, impact and personality to the wine but those stems also contain different sort of perfumes flavors uh, textures than what's in the fruit and so in a wine like this I think I particularly pick up what I describe as a character like gung pao tea mm. and it's this beautiful sort of spice character that seems to come from these lovely stems and so after the first sort of six or seven days of the ferment of just pressing down on the very top, uh, we've used up quite a lot of sugar. Well, we haven't. The yeast have eaten it, converted it into carbon dioxide and, and alcohol. And then we have the beautiful whole clusters at the bottom. So instead of just pushing down on the top of the cap to submerge that, I then start pressing down on the whole bunches at the base of the fermenter. And of course, as I do that, actually burst the cells. And do you know what happens when you like burst a little grape? It lets out, it lets <laughs> out a little wine. But no, as you burst the little grapes, uh, they'll release more sugar. And so it's a very, very nice sort of winemaking technique to have a long, gentle fermentation. And like the long, gentle ripening season, that long ferment at low temperatures allows you to keep plenty of perfumes and mm -hmm. lovely things in the wine. And so the, the 2016 was actually about a, a two week, 14 day ferment, which is actually quite a long time uh, for a Syrah ferment. But by using the, the techniques that we thought suited the composition of the mm -hmm. fruit, uh, hopefully it sort of made sense. And so around about after two weeks, we just gently remove the stems, the skins, the, the pulp from the wine and then pop it into the barrels for its maturation. 
And the, these barrels that we use are actually quite huge. They're the, the 500 litre puncheons. And so they're about two and a half, a normal, normal brick is 225 litres. And so this goes into the beautiful 500 litre puncheons because uh, bigger volume, smaller surface area of the oak. And so the puncheons allow this very, very gentle ingress of the oak elements, the oak personality into the wine because of course for us the most important thing is, is showcasing this beautiful fruit that says hello I'm here from <laughs> Margaret River I'm here from our block at lot 71 uh, Ellenbrook Road and so it's got a personality because we don't want it to smell overtly of oak because we can get oak from anywhere in the world we can't get these beautiful fruit perfumes from anywhere else. And really, we, we want to highlight our sort of postcode so we have a, a sense mm. of personality belonging to where we're from. And so in these large 500 litre puncheons, we actually finish off the primary or the alcoholic fermentation, actually have the secondary fermentation or the malactic fermentation occurring in this large format oak. And this is a style of wine that we only rack once. And if you're not a fully blown wine geek, racking simply means taking the wine out of the barrel, putting it to tank, cleaning out the yeast sediment and putting it back. And so most of the time we'll do what's called a clean racking and just basically take the very clear wine off the top. But with this approach, I actually do what's called a dirty racking. And so the, the dirty racking means we'll literally take all of the yeast out and it'll only be the heaviest sort of plant solids that had settled at the base of the barrel that we'll take out. And so we'll then put the wine in back in the same puncheon after the, the malactic fermentation, mm -hmm. but it'll still have all of its yeast in there with it. And then actually as a, a part of this winemaking technique, every month, apart from playing at the beautiful music that continues through the whole journey of the wine, will actually batonage it. And batonage just simply means stirring it. And so we go in with a, a handheld sort of metal propeller, wiggle it about, and that'll suspend all of the yeast that have settled to the bottom of the puncheon back into the wine. And so that keeps the wine actually very, very fresh because any of the oxygen that's ingressed through the oak barrel will be eaten or consumed by these, these yeast in the wine. And so it keeps it very fresh. But like our, our Chardonnay from a couple of weeks ago that we also batonage the lees, it actually puts a textural element into the wine. And to me, it seems to help sort of join the fruit, the acid, the oak elements together. And of course, over, over its time of maturation in these beautiful puncheons, uh, some of the elements of the yeast's personality become part of this wine. Elements and mainly the, the fruit personality, uh, some of the oak. And so it's this sort of layering of different things that, that seem to join together. We had one question, I think it's gone up a little bit early, about how do we maintain constant temperature and control the temperature um, during the process? Well, with the open fermenters, that's actually a, a pretty big challenge, but we sort of start that really at the beginning, that the, the fruit from the vineyard is all hand-picked uh, into quite small containers, and so we pick that at, at the very first light in the morning so that the fruit's typically sort of 15, 16 degrees C so anyway when it starts at the winery. But then I'll actually chill that fruit overnight in a, a cold room, uh, bring that temperature down to maybe 12 or 13 degrees C. And so by starting with the cool ferment or cool fruit and then actually keeping it in a a temperature controlled uh, barrel room that's a beautiful place, you know, 85% humidity, uh, 16 degrees C ambient. Uh, we worked out that with our fermenter sizes and the way we manage it, that we can sort of achieve a peak of around 20, 22 degrees C. Mm -hmm. 
which seems a lovely fermentation temperature because it lets out all the, the beautiful elements of the Syrah personality and fragrance and the soft sort of juicy tannins. And again, the temperature control is really based that instead of, say, having all the berries crushed so that the yeast can get to all the sugar in the juice at once, by having the whole berries at the bottom that we gradually squash over time on their bunches, that's how we can extend and control the fermentation, I guess, as, as part of our old school techniques that we use for this wine. I'm looking at the clock. And it's ticking down. We've been going for about 20 minutes now. Uh, so I think we need to taste some wine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? Think, oh, we could just talk about it. But. Well, I'm sort of not into tasting wine. I'm, I'm <laughs> into sort of drinking wine. So what sort of things does this wine say to you? Does it greet you or have a particular personality? You need to sit first. It's beautifully balanced. I think the fruit, for me, the fruit really shines. Um, and it's very smooth. We actually, I think we had a question earlier about um, why is the reserve so much silkier and smoother than, um, than other Shirazes? Is there a reason that you can... Uh, well, I wish I could say <laughs> it was the skill of the winemaker, <laughs> but I'd probably sort of like to divert this one and sort of thank the, the soils and the climate of Margaret River for just really delivering that composition of fruit. And of course, with the way we make this wine too, because the, the Syrah uh, berries are, are much softer skinned than, for example, Cabernet, we, we have a set of sort of bespoke winemaking techniques we apply to it so we don't uh, extract too much tannin and enough and I, I sort of look at my job as I, I want to take out from the fruit enough to have the wine beautifully balanced at the end of its maturation but I don't want to be doing things at the end of its maturation if there's too much tannin and taking out tannin mm. so I, I seek to try and get the right levels of extraction at the beginning with the whole berries, whole bunches, the the ripeness of the fruit, the gentle techniques and, and playing it gentle, sort of mm. non-aggressive music too. What's your music of choice? There are a few well, more references to, um, to your well, beautiful Well, to, to the hands. music. <laughs> these, these, to, well, we find early in the morning when, you know, it's a little cooler and that, we like to play something a little more edgy and faster like the Ramones to get the yeast waking and working and... That's sort of fine till mid-morning, but then sort of towards the afternoon when it's getting sort of ready for night and we want them to calm down a little bit, something like Nora Jones, oh, nice. so they can just sort of gently go into their, their evening. And so with, with a wine like this, I get all sorts of lovely like blackberries, cardamom, star anise, and gung pao tea, and they sort of coat my palate and sort of do... Lovely things, and then one of the things I just love about this one is it has these beautiful succulent levels of natural acidity. And so after those flavours, you have this beautiful rush of just gentle acidity come that sort of cleanses your palate. Um, and as it sort of cleanses your palate, it reveals other flavours and elements of the the wine's personality. So, what sort of things would you match this wine with? Me. Meaning food. Food. Oh. I would, I, well, obviously red meat. I think something something nicely cooked on a grill. Never well done. It has to be at least medium white. <laughs> what would you, what would you match it with? Well, one of, one of the things that I love is the, the flavours with, with things cooked on grills and that sort of charring character just seems to match beautiful with the, the spice and wildness and energy of this wine and of course being here in Western Australia one of the things that I love is lamb and so grilled lamb or lamb of any description mm. matched with this and another absolutely sublime match that seems to work beautifully is duck yes because the duck having just the, the slightly sort of darker flesh and a little bit more flavor than 
than some other sort of poultry. So I think think duck matches with that, and particularly duck if there's any sort of plum sauce or spice characters involved, the the sort of spice and spice, it sort of like it, it complements each other, not clashes. And so I, I love those sort of things. I'm just going to get in a bit closer because we have a long message from David. Um, Bruce, you studied wine at the University of California. In California, they also use the term Syrah. How does Californian Syrah differ in style from that of Margaret River? Oh, David, it, it, who I think is drinking a, a bottle with us right now. David, oh, sorry, you're a man of impeccable <laughs> tastes. It's really hard to be specific with the, the way that, say, Californian wine styles vary with here because California is such a big place. Um, and so I often sort of defer a little bit to the climate that, uh, for example, Margaret, Margaret River is, say, just a fraction warmer than, say, and I know we're talking about Syrah, but Bordeaux, whereas most of California and Northern California is a fair bit warmer. And so the Californian styles in general seem to be uh, richer, bolder tannins, bolder black fruit flavours that probably suit their climate and their sort of set of cultural values very well. But I like these wines from Margaret River that are just paired back a little bit that are slightly in the less of the dark red fruit spectrum, have hints of that dark red fruit, but to the slightly uh, redder uh, mulberry, raspberry, blackberry fruit, fruits as opposed to sort of very ripe satsuma plum. Uh, and our acid levels are probably a little bit more, so the wines, to me, uh, at least these, these style of Syrah wines just have a lovely sympathy with, with so many foods. How, speaking of um, acidity and tannins, which are essential to ageing wine, how long would you age this for? I mean, and how do you, how do you think it would develop? Well, in, in, in my cellar, these things often have a, a pretty short life <laughs> because I, I just love these. We're now at sort of four years into this journey and we've, we've got just a lovely balance of freshness mm. and tannin. Uh, but I see wines like this aging in a nice cellar quite easily for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it really sort of depends on what your your personal preference is. Uh, and I think from, from now uh, and over the next decade is when I'm going to be enjoying this What characteristics do you think cellar. would change as it gets older? I, I think as it matures, we'll see the, the tannins uh, just soften out a little bit and some of the very bright sort of crunchy red fruit characters, mm. we'll just see them fade slightly as we see some of the more secondary or characters of bouquet like, like violets and those sorts mm. of things gradually sort of develop over time. And one of the joys of, of these style of wine is actually watching how they do grow and do evolve mm. because you'll get different experiences every year that you open that bottle. And even as we've had this wine in the glass now mm. for a few minutes, uh, it'll actually continue to change and evolve on the table. And that to me is just one of the absolute joys mm. of the wine. And I think it's up to whoever the wine enjoyer and drinker to sort of work, work out roughly where they are. So they need a few bottles enjoyment. to try now and try well, later. Uh, a wine like this is probably about as scarce as hens to <laughs> because quite literally and quite honestly, uh, we only made 140 cases of this. How many bottles is that? How well, 140 that? times 12. <laughs> I'm a winemaker, not a mathematician. <laughs> Uh, and so this, this is a, a tiny amount of wine, 140 dozen, uh, and it was literally around three punchins, so three of the, the 500 litre barrels. So it's a, it's a tiny amount of wine, but what we really try and focus on is, is that absolute attention to detail, uh, joining all the little bits and pieces mm -hmm. together, and we're, we're just a tiny producer that are just striving to make the, the greatest possible wines we can.
I think you're doing pretty well. This text. Well, it's, it's, it's a journey, and it's a journey of refinement, attention to detail, uh, and just the opportunity to work continually with the same vines mm. on the same patch of soil, and it's just little refinement over time uh, that we do very, very gradually, because the, these wines are more so uh, this, uh, a philosophy of understanding the ingredients and translating through to the wine, more so than having a particular style in mind, that it's it's got to be the, the fruit, the climate, the composition of the fruit and our current sort of set of social values that are the foundation to the philosophy that then drives the interpretation of wine style. And that's what I think is a lot of fun, trying to work that out. Oh, we've got an answer. It's 1,680 bottles. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> there we go. I'm, 679 I'm now. Yeah, yeah, a few less. So, um, and so uh, this is also, I think, a, a day of not only celebration of beautiful Margaret River Syrah, but I think the uh, 18th of June is also quite an important day in the Stimson household. It is. Because it is. I think <laughs> it may be Barry's birthday. So, Barry, happy birthday, Barry. Happy birthday, Barry. I can see you all doing virtual toasts from here. <laughs> well, I hope everyone has enjoyed this chat and conversation because it's been a, a lot of fun and very relaxing. Uh, we're, of course, in the midst of our winter, which is why we have our fire here. Uh, but I hope this wine is, is showing and uh, presenting as beautifully here in Margaret River as it is in beautiful Singapore and the rest of the, the destinations where everyone's enjoying. Right. I think time to sign off. And so. just before we sign off too, this, this wine I think is, is such also a beautiful sort of reflection of the personalities of uh, Wendy and Barry, because I see the the beautiful perfumes and delicacy that dance around this wine is is Wendy, and then we go to the sort of the tannic structure of the wine and the deeper base notes of the tannin that's Barry, and so I think it's sort of a a beautiful union of sort of Wendy and Barry and their their personalities integrated with the the personalities of the fruit and to sort of see that that beautiful connection make, makes these wines to me uh, just so special and so enjoyable because it's really when you know all of the, the people involved and the, the passion that comes from the ground up, it sort of flows through with the purity of wines. And so cheers and happy birthday, cheers. Barry. Happy birthday, Barry. And <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce, for sharing your Cassandra, knowledge. thank you so much. If, um, if there are any questions that haven't been answered, we'll go through afterwards. And, and I think I've been doing too much talking, not enough drinking. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be back in two weeks. Um, keep tuned on social media. So we'll share what wine and what we're doing then. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night.